Hey everybody, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. Now we're going to do organometallic chemistry. So here it is, and so we're going to do the organometallic chemistry. Now from your textbook, it starts on page 999. It's uh, from the 10th edition of Solomon. But regardless, it's always the same. It's special topic G. So if you have an early edition of Solomon, just look for a special topic G in the table of contents and you'll find it. So basically, this is... Let, well, actually, let's get started with the uh, introduction. So, number one, let's talk about an introduction. Now, we've talked about organometallic chemistry before. Uh, last semester, we talked about grignards and alkalithiums. And there is other things that we've discussed, like, for example, H2 and palladium, to, in order to break a double bond or a triple bond down to a single bond, is an organometallic reaction. We just never really talked about the details until now, like how these things happen. So it turns out that organometallic chemistry is a very broad subject, and there's a lot of different rules that are, are, are special for this particular topic. So we're going to touch on this, but we don't really go into every single detail, okay? It's quite different than the organic chemistry, uh, or even gen chem in some cases, that we've learned about in terms of how we look at these molecules and how we figure out their interactions and reactions. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is the general idea that what we're dealing with is always a metal, and this is typically a transition metal, and somehow the metal has a coordination of a ligand, L. Now, ligands are things that are not metal. So M equals metal, and again, it's usually the transition metals, okay? And L equals a ligand, and these are non-metals. So these are could be organic, but it doesn't always have to be organic, but they're non-metals. So they're things that are not metal-like. And now, the way that we refer to them, even though I drew a, a bond between them, is actually that there, there's no real bonding here. This is called a coordination, okay? So metals and ligands, are, well, I should say ligands coordinate around metals, okay? So what that means is that their electrons come close. Um, electrons um, are close to the metal, but it's not a true bond, like in the, it's not a covalent bond. This is more ionic character to it, and so we say it's a coordination of ligands around the metal, okay? So we do draw the customary bond between them, like I, sh I show you here, this red bond, but it's really not a bond, it's a coordination. So just think about ligands as having electrons, that is the requirement, and that those electrons are coming close to the metal in order to satisfy the metal's uh, requirement, okay? And so that's what we're seeing here. Now, another thing that's important to recognize in this review is the idea of oxidation and reduction. So we've, we, we all know what this means, but I want to refresh our memories. Now, what oxidation means is that something lost or loss of electrons. So whenever something loses electrons, it is becoming oxidized. And reduction is the opposite, right? It's a gain of electrons. So when something is reduced, it's because it's gaining electrons. Now, we've, so, we've seen this idea of oxidation and reduction back in chapter uh, 11, last semester, 11 and 12. And what we found was that with organic chemistry, sometimes it's not a true loss or gain or electrons. It could be like, for example, a more electronegative atom and it's drawing electrons away from carbon, and so that's considered to be an oxidation, even though the electrons are still between the carbon and that other atom. Whereas in the case of metals, so with metals, it's truly a loss or gain, a full loss or gain of electron, okay? So again, let me just refresh your memory. If you have a carbon that has fluorine, we could say that this carbon is oxidized because the electrons are moving towards fluorine. So this carbon is oxidized, right? Compared to, let's say, if it had, let's say, a carbon with an H there, and we replaced the H with an F, right? So that carbon became oxidized. Now, 
Again, this idea of oxidation is not that it truly lost its electrons, but it's losing its electron density. It's moving away from that atom, the carbon, okay? Whereas with metals, it's truly an oxidation. So if I have, let's say, a metal, like let's say I have, um, I, I guess um, I'll do ruthenium. So if I have ruthenium and it's connected to a carbon, right? Or it, it's, I should say, coordinated with a carbon, and let's say it's CH3, well, this ruthenium also, being less electronegative than carbon, is oxidized, right? But unlike the top case, where the carbon is not truly oxidized in the sense that it completely lost its electrons, in the case of ruthenium, it is truly oxidized. So this has a loss of electrons. And it would, so for a carbon, it would be negative, and the ruthenium would be positive, okay? So this ruthenium, is truly a positive ruthenium. It has a plus charge, okay? It lost its electron. All right, so there's a slight difference when you think, and now this is actually it's kind of interesting because in Gen Chem, we consider things the way I'm describing now, right? It's truly oxidized, something positive, something negative. But because we switched our focus to organic chem, we learned that oxidation or reduction doesn't necessarily mean a full loss or gain of electrons. And so now I'm kind of bringing us back to what we would have known from Gen Chem. Okay, so this ruthenium is equal to being Ru plus and CH3 minus. That's what we're really looking at here. Whereas you can't say that this is not CH3 plus and F minus. That's not true, right? We know that that's not the case for carbon fluorine bond. It's not plus and minus. It's, they're still bonded to each other, okay? So that's my point. So whenever you think of oxidation or reduction, in the case of metals, we're going to think of it as being truly positive or negative, okay? So this is the idea so far. Now, let me just, for our introduction, I want to bring up another point, and that is, I guess I'll do it here, is this whole idea of the 18 electron rule. Now, this is another unusual idea, but it it's really makes sense. See, metals, and, and in particular, transition metals, have d orbitals, okay? So they have d orbitals available to them. So they have their s, their p, and then they have d. And so for that reason, the outer shell can be filled to 18 electrons, okay? so. Whereas, like, for example, a carbon has S and P, right? So for carbon, it has an S orbital and a P orbital. So you have this right here. Remember, for P, there's three Ps, Px, Py, Pz. And so for carbon, it wants eight electrons to fill its outer shell, right? Because remember, carbon has a second, it's a second row element. So it has a 2S and a 2P, right? So if you want to fill up carbon, then you go like this, right? So we have all these electrons here. I kind of did it on, on backwards, right? In terms of energy increasing. Not that it matters, but it's kind of unusual to see the P below the S, so I'm going to do that. Um, anyway, so here it is. You've got carbon that when it fills up its complete outer shell, it would have eight electrons. But now let's think about a metal. So metals have their, their 2S, for example. And actually, I'm going to get rid of the number 2 because that's not really applying here. It has an S. It has its P, one, two, three, but it also has D, okay? All transition metals have D orbitals. And if you remember, it's one for the S's, three for the P's, and five for the D's, five degenerate orbitals. Remember, degenerate means that these orbitals are equal in energy. So whenever you have a D, it comes in at five, as opposed to P, which comes with three, okay? And then you have F, which actually has 7, but we don't have to worry about F at all. So if we fill this up, we've got our 8 that we would expect, right? So we have right here is 8, but now we have an extra 5, which gives us another 10 electrons that you can fill in here, and that gives us 18 electrons. So because a metal has a d orbital, it would like to have 18 electrons in order to completely fill up its outer shell, okay? So that's the idea. That's where this 18 electron rule comes from. So, you know, 
when you think about it, we always talk about the octet rule, but there's nothing special about octet. There's just something special about completely filling your outer shell. So all atoms want to fill their outer shell. Hydrogen would like to fill its outer shell so it gets one extra, uh, gets two electrons. That are